So welcome, bienvenidos to today's workshop on making meaning of community level data. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants along with Nicole Young, who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And we're co-facilitating today's workshop with Eva Holt from DataShare Santa Cruz County. And our session today is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate your written comments and questions in the chat. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. I'll turn it over to Eva Holt to give us an overview of DataShare. Thanks, Nicole. I'm so happy to be here with you all today. So my name is Eva Holt and I'm a social impact consultant based here in Santa Cruz County. And one of the projects that I work on is DataShare. So if you're less familiar with the platform, uh, DataShare is an interactive data platform with over 400 indicators from local, state and national sources. We aim to have the updated version of all data and reports with the most current information. And because of that, data share is constantly changing and new indicators and reports are being added. Um, our, our aim is to be the central hub of information that creates alignment by allowing everyone to measure outcomes with the same metrics and indicators and to integrate data sets such as the safety net clinic utilization data that has previously not been easily available to the public. So we know that data share uses have included students, researchers, advocacy groups, program evaluators, grant writers, and fundraising efforts. And today um, I look forward to talking a little bit more about some of those uses and experiences with you all. Thank you, Eva. And if you would, if you're new to DataShare, or even if you've used it before, you can see a link in the chat if you'd like to start exploring it. And we'll do some explorations together a little later on in today's session. So we just wanted to go over some goals for our session today. We are hoping that everyone can learn more about why community level data are important for improving well being and for advancing equity and also um, some tips and navigation to understand and make meaning of the data currently on DataShare using an equity lens. And then some various ways to use the community level data that you'll see on DataShare, as well as some other sources for these multiple uses that Eva mentioned, planning, evaluation, grant writing, advocacy, research, and more. Before we dive into all that, we did wanna ask you some questions about how you feel about the words program planning and evaluation. Do they make you wanna do a happy dance? Do you feel a mix of excitement and apprehension? Do they put you to sleep into a deep trance or do you run screaming from the room? Okay, we've got some answers coming in. Uh-oh, somebody's going to go into a deep trance. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, we've got a mix of excitement and apprehension. So a little bit of the, the roller coaster that we have on the boardwalk. So one, one trance, one running from the room. All right, well, hope you'll stay with us a little, give us a chance to keep you awake and in the room. And the rest of you will try and do the, reduce the apprehension and increase the excitement on the roller coaster. Okay, thanks for participating in that poll, but we do, we do understand that these words um, 
elicit a range of reactions. And what we'd like to do is just try to demystify some of this terminology and the concepts behind them in order to make um, the data on data share more useful to all of you for different purposes. So let's start with program planning. We've got a definition here that is pretty standard and it's just explaining that any program puts together um, a set of planned activities that are supported by different resources, some internal, some external, and all of these together are designed to achieve some specific outcomes for individuals that you serve, groups um, across your community or a broader community. Program planning is just how you design and intend to achieve the activities that are supported by these resources to reach specific outcomes for specific people or groups. And there's some key steps in program planning that include trying to identify the issue that you want to address, which is surprisingly um, skipped sometimes <laughs> when we start thinking about a program plan. And who is affected by that? Who are we doing this for? Who are we doing this with? And how are we trying to address this issue? So we, if you've been to some of our training and TA in the past, you'll know that we're big fans of logic models and theories of change to help you determine these pieces of a program and how they fit together. And we'll be offering more training specifically on those tools um, later this year. And there are also some in the um, core training archives. So if that's, if that's new terminology or just something you wanna refresh her on, there's some resources for those. And we also just wanna emphasize the role of equity in all of these pieces that we're discussing. So for the program design piece, that would mean trying to involve the people who the, the program is trying to serve in the design and the implementation and the evaluation of a program so that we can be mindful of always trying to address the, the root causes behind those needs and issues like systemic racism, for example, and incorporating equity into every piece of program planning, including data collection, how a program is staffed, what questions you ask in an evaluation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who's gonna go over some evaluation concepts as well. Oops, sorry. Yeah, starting again with just a, a definition of what we mean by evaluation. So think of it as you know, you've designed your program, uh, you're going to deliver or implement your program. You're going to wanna to know, did it work the way that you thought it would? Did it produce the kind of results and impacts that you were hoping for? So the evaluation is your assessment of your activities and your efforts and doing it in a systematic way that allows you to be able to uh, gauge and then communicate, did it work the way that you intended and uh, get you closer to the results that you hope to achieve? So that's what I mean by evaluation. It's, it's not research, right? So not everything has to be that really rigorous level of scientific study. Um, and so even if it's not you know, at the level of scientific research, evaluation is still really important. And it's most helpful if you approach it in a systematic way so that you, um, you know, before you ever start designing a survey or before you ever start asking the questions that you go through some key steps, starting with assessing your readiness for evaluation, uh, particularly if this is something that is new for your organization or your program, um, you're still learning about evaluation, you're not quite sure. So it's really assessing, do you have enough staff to do evaluation? Do you need to contract with someone to help you out? Um, do you have kind of the right skill sets and tools to help you implement your evaluation? And so that could be everything from um, kind of knowing the pros and cons of different evaluation methods like surveys versus focus groups, um, versus looking at other um, types of data, 
to things like what is your method for entering and tracking your data to be able to uh, kind of track, you know, count it and analyze it later. So really looking at, do you have the right skills and tools in place or do you need to bring in some additional and find some additional support for that? Part of that process also of assessing your readiness uh, will be engaging different groups who will be involved in the evaluation. So that could again be, and you really want to look at engaging uh, people with different skills and perspectives, you know, your program staff, people who will be participating in whatever activity or program you're providing, potentially your funders, if there are you know, specific things that you've promised to measure or demonstrate. So really look at uh, who all might have different ways of thinking about this that could help inform your thinking about your evaluation and what it is that you're measuring and why. Uh, tying it back to your program planning. So describe what your program is, make sure you're really clear on what it is you're delivering and what the result is that you're aiming for. Because then all of that will help you focus your evaluation design where you're really clear about the purpose of the evaluation what questions you are trying to answer versus what things you're just going to assume have happened, or you're not going to invest as much time or resource to really measure um, the impacts of your programs. And this is where you can think about how you're going to use your results. You can think about how to do this with an equity lens um, so that then again, uh, that all of that helps prepare you to design your actual evaluation methods for gathering information and insights. Again, whether that's through interviews, surveys, focus groups, any other methods like that. This last step oftentimes gets forgotten, the learn and share. So once you've gathered all your data and you've analyzed it and you've made sense of your program level data, what are you gonna do with it? How do you um, do more with it than, other than just put it in a report back to your funder and say, okay, now we're done. <laughs> How can you use that to really learn, to do some continuous quality improvement in your program? How do you share the results in a way that um, is strengths-based, that helps uh, uh, kind of encourage and show others how to think about program design and evaluation with an equity lens? And so when we mean, you know, when we say that, we mean, you know, centering equity in evaluation asking yourselves questions up front and, and really all throughout the process about, again, what are we measuring and how? Um, and who decides what's going to get measured and how it gets measured? Is it uh, something that small group of you in a room are deciding together? Or is this something that you're deciding based on engaging different groups in designing your evaluation? Another way to think about equity-centered evaluation is looking at who then is analyzing the data and interpreting it and communicating it in writing or visually to other people because there's a lot of choices there about um, even how things are phrased or what icons you use that uh, can help reframe or change the narrative um, from one that's more deficit-based and kind of like, uh, look how great we are. We saved we saved these people from themselves, right? The, your evaluation and how you communicate your results is an opportunity to reframe some of those um, kind of stereotypes or limiting messages or um, narratives that you know may not be what you are wanting to uh, promote and highlight. So those are all some things to keep in mind uh, as you think about designing your evaluation. There are a couple of resources and we have some coffee chats and uh, learning sessions coming up that where we'll have a chance to dive further into these if any of you are interested, uh, including the core continuum of results and evidence, which is a tool that Nicole and I developed a few years ago to really help expand the thinking about what we mean by evidence-based programs and practices, really thinking of it as a spectrum. Uh, as well as a framework for program evaluation. It's very similar to the steps I just highlighted and that comes from the Centers for Disease Control. So there are a couple different resources, again, more opportunities coming up to learn more about those, but I'm gonna turn it back to Nicole to talk about then community indicators. Thank you. So the community indicators are just the ultimate impact that you are hoping to contribute to through the activities that you're planning um, and, and wanting to accomplish. They tell one part 
of the story about well being, or sometimes about the absence of well being across a broader community. That's why we call them community indicators. But the most important part of them is that you're not responsible for or doing them or trying to accomplish them by yourself alone. So the idea is that community indicators reflect the efforts of numerous individuals and organizations and that moving the needle on something that's that difficult um, and that um, aspirational requires multiple efforts over time. Um, and the idea is if those efforts are aligned and working in the same direction, we're more likely to see progress. But they're not meant to um, feel so overwhelming and burdensome that that you feel like your efforts alone are responsible for, for changing these community indicators. And there are some steps related to those. So looking at the indicators that, that feel like they are the most relevant to you. So that, are they available? Are they accurate? Do they respond to the set of activities that you are trying to design in your program plan? Um, are, are your efforts matched to those indicators? And do you have an opportunity um, to share your impact on those community indicators and what happens next? And so this is one of the really um, exciting things about data share is that they give us opportunities to look at indicators together. As Eva said, that we're all looking at the same data points. They're, they're all current to the best availability that um, is possible. So you're not having to hunt around and find them all on your own. And often they're available, often but not always, work in progress. They're often available through an equity lens, meaning that we can disaggregate indicators and data by factors like age or race or ethnicity or geography that can help us pinpoint where the gaps are greatest and where there's progress. And we have an opportunity to look at some of those through, um, through data share. And Eva's gonna walk us through some examples. But before we do that, we just wanted to um, mention that the core results menu is a great place to start. And Gisela's gonna put a link in the chat um, so you can see how indicators are organized by different core conditions. And that can just help you have a, a shorter list of indicators to look at for a particular topic. And Eva's gonna walk us through some other examples as well. So Eva, I'll stop sharing my screen. And maybe you wanna start yours with one of the data spotlights. But do we have any questions before we turn to actually using data share? Feel free to raise your hand or um, ask a question in the chat. I'm not seeing anything immediately, Eva, but just feel free as we're talking. All right, great. Well, um, thank you so much for that um, framing, Nicole. And I'm going to go ahead and share. So we have a, def um, a few different ways that we, oh, um, that we have kind of thought to organize um, topic areas um, that are relevant to our community and try and highlight some trends that might be helpful for evaluation. So one of them are these data spotlights. And like I mentioned earlier, we're constantly improving. So the format that the spotlights that I'll show today is one that we had um, that we had kind of we have thought out about two years ago and now we're in the process of changing that format and always open to further feedback. Um, I think one of the great things about a space like this is that we get to chat about like what what the data is actually saying and how to best pick the data that will help you understand your impact the best. So, um, and sometimes it's not just 
the data point. It's like going in and looking at the sources. So um, for the spotlights, we like to take a look at um, kind of just some high level, what does the data say, the data that is available on the platform say on big trends? So we have a snapshot and here um, we've just written out, you know, um, some information on what mortgage owners spend, um, what renters spend, and then um, what it looks like uh, in terms of affordability and wages um, and paying your rent in Santa Cruz County. So kind of a distilled version of the data that's below. And then um, when possible, when the data is um, shows a statistical significance, we'll put a variation in the county. So whether that's race and ethnicity or by region, in this case, it's about re, um, it's about a regional variation. So here we've we noted that the data showed, for example, that 60% of renters in South County spend more than a third of their income on rent compared to other regions in the county. Um, so um then we highlighted some key data points um, that talk about um, our housing. Um, so if you go into, can, do you want me to go into one of these or do you want to come yeah, back to it? I, yeah, go ahead and just, I think for some people who may not know how data share works, you can, there's several ways to get at the detail. So Eva's going to show you one. But maybe yeah. as you do that, Eva, do you want to say a little bit about how you how you chose these, how you yeah. arrived at this this shorter yeah. list? Yeah, absolutely. So if you land on the data share homepage, it'll give you uh, find data. And when you go into our search library, there's multiple ways to find data. And you can just put in housing or homelessness. So I reviewed all of the data to the way that um, the process is, is that I review all of the data and see which indicators are under these impact areas and then which ones have data that is most meaningful. So data that has disaggregations, ideally, whether it's um, on demographic groups or um, regional breakouts, um, because that really is the most valuable data um, that we can um, show the public. And so uh, so that'll kind of trim down, you know, um, maybe we have about 50 indicators that have something to do with housing. Out of those 50 indicators, only 20 of them may have disaggregations. And out of those 20, I'll go in and look at the sources, see what the trends say, make sure that um, a lay person that is looking at the data might have better understanding of one or another, because some of the data points are actually very similar as well, So, um, which you'll see here. Um, so once I've done that, then I'll try and pull out the snapshots and um, and I'll draft up a page. And for most of the spotlights, it tends to we try and do the spotlights on an issue that is relevant or timely in our community. And so for housing, um, for this page, I had um, uh, staff from Housing Matters look at it, as well as um, staff from the county um, um HMIS program look at this page and just do a quick view of like, is this making sense? Is, is the data aligning with what they're seeing on the ground? Um, and uh, making sure that we're having a conversation with the experts in the field and not just pulling this large scale data and trying to make meeting um, non with no context. Um, yeah, and okay. so, so as Eva's describing, for those of you who may not realize, so DataShare compiles data from lots of different sources through the, the platform bend, vendor, Healthy Communities Institute conduit. And so Eva's gonna show you a couple of these, but you'll see that instead of you having to go around and search for them, they're, they're gathered here for you. And if they're on here, they're, they're the most recent version of whatever this data point is. Yeah. So go ahead, Eva, sorry. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Well, before we go down the rabbit hole, I'll just move us down the page because I know I know how I respond once I get in the rabbit hole. Um, yeah, so, rabbit holes. Fun, fun, but distracting. <laughs> yes. So I'll just say that after the initial kind of data um, snapshot, um, we like to have um, some local reports that can fill in the blanks, um, and then some community strategies that are addressing the um, the health issue. 
Um, we have in on this page, we did a breakdown by region. Um, just to show another overview of the variations um, and any disparities that we might find between the regions or groups. And um, then we asked for some help making us sure that we're um, uh, giving a resource that makes sense. So if you were to go explore one of these indicators, each of these may have a different source. And I'll just go to... Um, when you hover over this data point, it'll give you what it what the comparison is. So um, here it says compared to California counties, Santa Cruz County has a value of 26.5%, which is in the worst 25% of counties. So let's go find out a little bit more about what it means to have a severe housing um, problem. So when you go to the indicator detail page, it'll just, it'll give you the name of the indicator and then it'll give you the measurement period and you can, it'll always give you the most recent one. And then it'll give you an explanation of what this indicator is. Um, oops. Oh, oh, pardon me. Um, <clears throat> and then it'll con contextualize this indicator under why is this important um, in terms of public health. And so here you can see just by looking at the icon that we're not doing great. Um, and um, this um, indicator comes from the county health ranking source. It'll give you the measurement period down here. It's maintained by our platform vendor. And it was last updated um, this time last year. So that just means that the source was looked at to make sure that um, it wasn't that we didn't have to add a new measurement period. And at that point, it wasn't added. But you can see that these are four-year measurement periods. So um, it'll be published soon, likely this April. We would need to go into the details of publishing it um, or our publishing schedule for me to be completely accurate on that. But let's say that this is an indicator that you really want to find out more about. You would go to the source page, County Health Rankings, to see what the methodology is, et cetera. Um, but it'll give you a basic comparison with other counties, um, with the US, the California value, the US value, um, what it looked like previously, and if we have a statistical trend. Um, so here, this um, when you hover it over, it'll give you the statistical trend, that, which is in this case that over time, the Santa Cruz value is decreasing significantly, which means that supposedly our severe housing problems are getting better. Um, and, and Eva, do you have any I'll stop. Yeah. examples, um, in mind of ways that people have used housing data from data share in some of those reports or presentations or, or maybe show people how they can, uh, download something from, from here into their own reports or presentations? Yeah. Um, I, we're well, we're currently in conversations um, with Housing Matters to update this page. Um, and so I think that those conversations um, are really helpful to understand which of the data points best align with um, people's program goals. Um, and I know that the that the data has been helpful um, for them to do some comparison with their internal program data. So kind of comparison what the population is doing versus what they're seeing. And sometimes those can be really different. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you have to freak out like your program data is wrong or that the population health data is wrong. It's just important to note those differences and see if the knowledge from the local expertise and on the ground program can fill in some of that, which is why the local reports are so important. Um, and um, if you are interested in just snapping this data into your own report, to be honest, you can just screenshot it. <laughs> that is very easy. But also you can download it um, if you want to just have the data points. So I know a lot of people do their um they're reporting in different design programs like Canva. So you can download the CSV and then put it into your Excel or your design program if you want to create your own tables. Um, if that's something that your that your team has um, capability for or capacity for. Um, 
And I just, I also will show that you can just download the picture of the graphs as well. So um, you can download the, the PDFs or the JPEGs and then um, add them um, into your uh, reporting. Yeah, that's a really handy feature. And Eva, what if somebody wanted to create their own data spotlight with some Let's do it. Data? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, I am currently working on a spotlight um, with the Women's Commission, and it's been great. So what I did for that process, um, just as a, a comparison to what we did here, is I looked at our data library, so those 400 plus indicators, and then filtered for which ones had gender disaggregations. And um, under those gender disaggregations, there's, I think there was like 50 or 60 of the data points that had gender disaggregations. Then I went in and I looked at which one of the disaggregations were most statistically stable. So because different um, regions in the county have um, different race and ethnicity um, groupings uh, for male and female um, people, some of the data, like you just can't count on the numbers and there will be a note on those data points. And so initially, as an example, I had looked at those and put them on our spotlight. And when I spoke with the Women's Commission, like their experts in their field, they were confused by the statistical significance or insignificance of the um, race and ethnicity groupings. And so we removed them. And what what I'm working on with them is really thinking about, okay, like if we don't have this information, what does that mean? How do we fill that gap? Who is filling that gap? Um, you know, so maybe we have um, some good groupings for race and ethnicity around um, Hispanic Latino people and um, white folks, but then we don't have very great information around our Asian um, women or, you know, um, our Black and African American population. So those gaps can be further explored um, with you know, with the commissioners and um, with the groups that they um, they help support. Um, yeah, and actually all of the spotlights are going to get a, a, a makeover this year um, is my goal. So um, if there's one, if there's topics of information that you would love to take a look at um, or are specific to your program area, I am um, hoping to do at least two new subject areas this year and then um, to update the ones that we have. So housing is um, currently going to be updated for sure. Um, and we'll be looking also, I, I think we have time for the environmental spotlight, but if not, yeah. um, I'm could hoping you, to do the environmental cover... spotlight too. Great. Thanks. You heard it here first. So nominate something for a data spotlight if, if you're so inclined. But yes. Eva, do you mind hovering over the data spotlight tab there just to show people what the options are right now. Yeah, so there's yeah. those are the current ones and then there's some past ones. Yeah, and I'll say for the past ones, like for um, adolescent LGBTQ, there's definitely more data available or the sexual orientation and gender identity ones. There's more, but there just isn't great population health data on those particular subsets. So this is a great place for local subject matter experts to really provide that qualitative perspective. Um, um, and, and part of the reason is the population sizes, um, why, why we don't have availability, but also because in terms of the field of data equity and what we collect or don't collect, we just now, the census just now, this coming census will have sexual orientation and gender identity data available as a standard, but that is something that... Um, is, is new to the field in terms of having a statistical comparison that is available. Um, so um, we're, but we're really excited about that in the future to be able to fill in those blanks. Great, and you just responded to Cheryl's suggestion in the chat, so thank you both. Um, yeah, so let's talk through the, um, the environmental conservation one and just reminding everybody, these spotlights are just another way to distill, curate, gather from the hundreds of indicators that are on DataShare. So um, if you haven't explored DataShare yet, just reserve some time to do that. But know that there are some ways to slice and dice the data that make it a little easier and less overwhelming if 
if that's the state you find yourself in. Um, but Eva will talk us through another data spotlight and then we'll show you another way to, to look at some um, curated information. Oh, and okay. Eva, you're getting an, an offer of a, a graduate researcher at the Diversity Center to work together on some of the LGBTQ data. Oh my gosh, how exciting. Yes. Okay, let's do Love it. That. Let's do it. Okay, um, so let's do the environmental conservation spotlight. Great. Um, again, you'll see the similar format um, with the snapshot at the top. Um, and in this area, we, ju we just have less indicators available. We're hoping to um, address that in the future. Um, we're working with some of our with our vent with our data vendor um, um, to identify data that uh, will better speak to environmental justice and conservation. Um, and if we have time, I can get into the details of kind of what you know what makes sense to put data, what data makes sense to put on the platform um, versus not. But um, you'll see that there are some um, key. Uh, some key bucket areas. So the quality of our natural environment and natural resources, um, some climate change resiliency um, indicators, and then transportation. Um, and some of these indicators are outdated and that is because of, um, we used to have these available on the community assessment project, um, which are some of the indicators that we have on the platform. Um, but um, so these are old, but they're up here and uh, we hope to get a comparative value um, from a different data set soon. Um, and then for weather and climate, these are indicators that are reported to the EPA. And so we know that um, there is a standard mandated measure um, that we can count on for um, trend over time indicators. Um, so um, yes, where this is another one of the spotlights that I'm hoping to to give a makeover to this year. Um, and then we have our local reports, um, some local policies and strategic plan plans. And in this indicator or, or in this spotlight, we decided to add a whole bunch of indicators in the bottom. Um, to um to provide some context um, for folks that are more um aligned to a certain area of impact around environmental health so whether um your uh, program is tracking you know um air quality or pollution um or um some more built environment opportunities so um you can go into these categories and take a deeper dive. And you'll see here, just in terms of usability of the data, you'll see that this says save card. So you can save these and come back to them. Um, and we can, do we have time to learn more on this yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. So, okay. What is this? Access to exercise opportunities. Um, so we're all in the green here in terms of that we're doing good compared to um, let's find out a little bit more about what that means. So again, access to exercise opportunities is the name of the indicator, the measurement period. Um, it'll always give you the most recent one. And then, um, the description is that, um, the percentage of individuals who live reasonably close to a park or recreational facility. Um, so these built environment indicators are, um, are great for program planners, um, because a lot of programs will address built environment gaps. Um, so something to take a look at in terms of a category. Um, again, um, this is a county health rankings indicator. Um, so a, a data set to further explore, um, if this is your field and, um, Again, if you hover over, it'll give you a comparison. So in this case, Santa Cruz County has a value which is in the best 50% of counties. Um, so we have greater access to exercise opportunities compared to other California counties, as well as when we're compared to the, the U.S. and um, federal and state value. 
Um, this is an interesting data set because when you look at it, you can see that there's a change in methodology. So that just means that if you're looking at this, um, it would be useful if you have enough periods of measure to kind of, this is what I do. Um, I don't know if this is what statisticians would do, but that the years previous to the change in methodology, I really cannot compare them to the post years. Um, so here's where we here's where we stand today, and I would only use the data um, with the current methodology. Um, and then you'll see here an explanation, and it looks like in 2023, the county health rankings switched their methodology um, to census blocks. And so uh, uh, that will change the methodology again for the next data set. Um, yeah, I think oh, any, any questions so far on these spotlights or, or drilling down on the data? Well, Eva, let's just to illustrate some other ways that people have used data share. Um, let's look at those local progress pages. Okay, great. Well, I'll start with cradle to career. So if you go to local progress, you'll see that there's, um, well, the core results menu is here, but there's a few other groups that are, have aligned their performing evaluation um, techniques and data points with what is also on data share. So with Cradle to Career, um, in terms of process, we've been partnered with Cradle to Career since 2020. And um, they have a set of indicators that are um, that they use for their program, which they, um, you know, that's just the data that they collect. But then they compare those to how the population is doing at large. So with all of the local progress pages, um, these are all coalition based progress indicators that are listed here um, so that a whole group of um, people working on the same problem can have the same set of data points to track. Um, and I realize this is in terms of navigation, it, it doesn't come as intuitively because for some reason the vendor has put their menu on top, but it is a menu. It just looks a little different. So it's on the top instead of on the side. And you can see that it'll give you the mission, the desired long-term outcomes, and then under each one of these, we have data points. Um, and what I have, and you can also navigate with the um, with the arrows on the sidebar. So what, what we did with Cradle to Career is I worked with their um, program director um, to look at the list of data that most aligned with their impact areas. So for them, good education um, is one of their impact areas. And um, under that category, I think that I recommended, you know, I went through the source list and recommended five or six indicators, and they went through them and chose the ones that they wanted to be tracking. Um, so it'll give you an overview. Again, um, it's just a different way to look at the data in a curated fashion. So all of their partners um, you know, when we started working with them, they were based in Live Oak, but now it's a countywide initiative. And so countywide, their partners can look at this as, you know, an indicator that is helpful in tracking the well-being of the population they're best trying to serve. Um, and if, if, you know, going back to our earlier slides about program planning and evaluation, if you're looking for some ideas or examples of how other people have used data for those purposes, these local progress pages are a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, Cradle to Career is also very focused on advocacy. So um, some of the data points that they chose are less about um, kind of health and well-being and, and a, more about what aligns with their advocacy um, goals for the for the current um, strategic plan planning years or the strategic goals for for their current phase. So, for example, here they have children with health insurance um, under good health, and they um, they are tracking this. And um, I know that they will look at this data before their legislative visits as well as before their strategic planning sessions. 
mm-hmm. um, with their parent organizers as well. Um, so so I think multiple just, uses, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I think I'll stop there for okay. now, mm-hmm. and um, if we want, I could also I could show one of the local progress pages that has integrated their own data. Yes, that would be interesting. Okay. Um, I know that we had planned to do a different one, but um, <laughs> I just want to show this because people always ask, and I just thought about it now. So um, let's see. Let's do. Let's do. Let's do. Let's do the safety net coalition. So this is. Well, I think this is one of the most impactful ways that you can come together as a group. Um, so you have conversation, multiple conversations. This is what this group has done to think about what data they want to track. And internally, they track data and they provide it to us. Um, so I won't go through everything, but this is the Safety Net Coalition. Um, and they have some mandated reports that they have to do. And they, oh, oh, you know what? I think my browser might not let me, I have to be on a different browser, but um, their, their clinic data, they all compile it together. So the multiple partnerships compile their data together. And then we embed that data on here and we compare it to the population health. So that process that you might be doing internally with your team um, can also be done externally here. Um, and it's just going to give me this wheel of fortune because I already know that my browser won't support the Tableau. Um, so I'll stop there. Maybe let me check well. the chats. Yeah. Yes. You. Yeah. I know that the um, the links are in the chat. Thank you so much, um, Giselle. Thanks, Eva. So just so just the takeaways are multiple ways to slice and dice data on data share through the data spotlight or local progress pages. But you can also create your own combinations of data. You can explore um, in so many different ways that we can't cover all of them today. But we did want to give you a chance to practice this together and and ask us questions while we're all together. So um, we'll put up, this is a completely low pressure, um, no stakes exploration of data share at whatever level of familiarity you have with the platform. And I'll just um, share my screen one more time here. So if you go to the um, the data share site, and just I'll put the link in the chat again. Um, whatever subject you, whatever topic area or initiative you work on, you can search for some indicators if you haven't already, and then we'll just talk through them together, whoever wants to share. So what are some community indicators that you think your program um, contributes to? Do you see any equity dimensions of those already on data share? Are there any that might be on your wish list, something you're wondering about or would like to know? How do you think you could use these? Um, or maybe you're already using them to inform your program planning or your evaluation. And do they raise any evaluation questions for you, something you're wondering about or something um, that you think your program could influence with that indicator? So we'll just give you a few minutes to, let's say 10 minutes to just think about some of those things and we'll come back together at um, about five after 12 to share. And if you need help, um, navigating in any way, just uh, either raise your hand or ask a question in the chat and we'll do our best to um, to help out. But this is just an opportunity to learn together. And whether you're new to this or have some experience with data share, we hope you'll learn some new way to explore. And Gisela put these questions in the chat, so I'll stop my share so we can see each other. So first of all, any, any questions about what we're what we're up to right now? Okay. Bring this to in case you're starting from scratch on the DataShare landing page. 
you can just enter a keyword term right here in this find data search to start out. There's a question in the chat about how current the data might be or might not be. So for, for someone looking at a particular data set, the data are not super recent. Um, and the question is, where do you get 2023 data? The data on DataShare are the most recent available. So um, HCI Conduent is searching the different sources, American Community Survey or particular data sets, um, state data sets, national data sets, regional data sets. So it may be that for your particular area, the 2023 data may not be available yet. There are different kinds of lags in the data. They might have to be cleaned or edited or, um, or go through some other process before they're released. Um, so those just vary from indicator to indicator and from topic area to topic area. So certain, and certain indicators um, may have to go back and forth. They get reported from a local source to a state or national source, and then they come back. Um, so it just might depend on what you're looking at. And, but if you know of a more recent source or a better source, um, that would be good to know. Thanks and, for the question. Yeah. Um, and then just to add to that, Nicole, um, some of the state agencies are notorious for having a lag in their data, like a lot of the DOJ, the Department of Justice data is significantly old <laughs> and um and it's it's yeah so so there's some agencies that are just not updating on their end and then but but if it's an indicator that you'll see where it says the source uh, management or maintained by um if it says data share then we can respond to that directly so because that's data that is managed by us maintained by us and we'll we get it from a local source. So we'd be able to give you more thorough information of, oh, okay, that data set is lagging because of COVID or because um, they're cleaning the data for identifiers. And we expect, you know, we can give you an expected um, timeline for when that will be um, updated. I could also give you an expected timeline for indicators that um, we don't maintain. Um, the general rule is that they are up on the site um, from from our vendor within three months of being published to the public. Thanks, Eva. Any other questions? I can pretty much guarantee that if you have a question, others have it too. So don't be shy. Does anybody feel inclined to share their search experience looking at community indicators? We'd love to hear just what worked, what didn't work. Um, there's always a way to learn about a new new path through data share and navigating all the data there. So please uh, feel free to share whatever your search yielded, whether it was a little or a lot, or even if you had a struggle with it, we could probably all learn from that as well. Is there anybody on our um, session today who's brand new to data share? Hi, Amy, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm I'm having fun here. Um that was that was really easy to um because I'm I'm working with nourishing generations and we do nutrition and um a little bit of fitness, but mostly like cooking and nutrition um, and mostly with kids, not exclusively, but um, it was really easy to find um, data about, I guess they do like a fifth grade um, health assessment and you can, I could very easily find data about um, the number of kids that are considered overweight or under, you know, like what, you know what's their what's their health status um in the in terms of those basic metrics in the fifth grade and then it was um you could disaggregate by 
gender and by ethnicity. And so that was really, you know, that definitely revealed some differences. So that was, that was really um, just like, bing, there it is. <laughs> so it was delightful. <laughs> how, how delightful for and us to hear how, that as well. How, how delightful as a, you know, <laughs> I mean, my, this is not like my usual, um, experience with research in graduate school or whatever it's not all like there for you like that so it was it was delightful and um and the other thing I really appreciated was just being able from there to see like oh here's some related you know uh, programs from random various places like Florida and the UK where they're doing health, nutrition, education, exercise, education for kids. And I'm like, oh, how fun. Yeah, you know, just like looking at all the related kinds of things that people are doing around the world, um, programs that kind of have some something similar with us in, in terms of their goals and aspirations and things. So this is, yeah, I, I'm appreciating this. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And to the rest of you, we did not plant Amy's comment or experience. <laughs> I'll just say I'm having fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe you had a, um, I don't know what your survey response was for our poll early on about the mix of anticipation or apprehension and excitement or going into a deep trance or living. Oh, in I, I, no, I, I, um, I logged on right in the middle and people had oh, already okay. answered and I wasn't sure what the question was. So oh, I didn't. Okay. So it was just what the, program planning and evaluation words might trigger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm hoping that we moved you along something to make this all feel a little easier, but and delightful wasn't even in our, um, in oh, our it wasn't even a so that's great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I hope that, um, so sometimes it's um, an experience like Amy's where you're lucky and there's, you know, there's more data, more disaggregated data. It's easier to find than you expected. But sometimes it's the opposite. It's not as current or it's not quite a, as great a fit with whatever you were looking for. And um, it just it does reward some um, nosing around and figuring out some different different ways to get at uh, some of the same kinds of indicators. But I'm really glad Amy mentioned the um, the links to other programs. If you're um, in program planning and evaluation, if you're struggling to come up with how to phrase an outcome or an objective or a goal or looking for what, you know, what, what should we be measuring or what could we be measuring those kinds of links um, to what other programs do can really be, again, a great source of ideas and inspiration um, things we might not have thought of on our own. And you don't have to come up with it on your own. There are lots of people who have probably um, gone through some of the same questions that you've got. So those are great places to start and they're kind of collected for you um, either on the indicator uh, with related programs or on the promising practices part of data share. We can go into that a little more later too. Does anybody else want to share their their search experience or any any aha moments from looking at community indicators relevant to your work? And again, any anywhere on that range from frustrating to delightful, we're open to it. Well, I am. I'm Susan. Hi, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm on the board of the Art Center in Ben Lomond, uh, the Mountain Art Center. And um, we're mostly volunteer-run organization. Uh, in the past, we've had volunteer grant writers. And right at the current time, we're without one. So as a board member, I'm sort of researching um, <laughs> uh, and um, yes, I I enjoyed the first um, uh, core presentation you did last week, and uh, you know I just find it interesting. And um, I think since COVID, um, particularly living you know out of Santa Cruz and stuff, uh, we feel a little isolated up here. So 
this is a way of, you know, connecting with other people who are experiencing the same sort of questions and struggles. So, well, yeah, I, I could find the population data and some of that kind of thing I know would be helpful. I just know in writing reports for some of the grants we've gotten that they want that kind of information. And so... I'm glad I have found a place to get it and you can share Good. that with other people. So, um, you know, we're mainly an organization that does arts education and exhibits. So um, it's not fitting into a lot of these categories, but uh, certainly the information is interesting. Well, I'm glad that you've found a resource for some of what you're after and also kudos to you as a board member for trying to help out the organization, um, sometimes an untapped resource, but. Oh yes, we've been very lucky, <laughs> very lucky. <laughs> That's <volunteers>. great. <laughs> well, and I, yeah. I hope you'll be encouraged to spend some more time looking for data that might be a better fit, so. Yes, well, I, I, I really enjoyed both these sessions. Great. That's good to hear. Thank you. And Susan, um, I'm going to put the link in the chat, but um, sometimes it's just important for reporting to have an understanding of the population demographics. So we actually yeah. have a demographics um, page um, that'll give you a summary of population um, <clears throat> uh, race, ethnicity, age, sex, households and income, housing, education, um, and employment for different regions in the county. And you can, mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can uh, just share real quick um, what that looks like, because we know that that's actually one of the um, resources that um, people find most helpful. So you can, um, you find it under the data tab and I'll put it mm -hmm. in the chat. So you, if you, if it's, you're having a hard time finding it, Santa Cruz County demographics. Yes, and I did find it. You I did. did find that, but now what about the San Lorenzo Valley, which is. Here? Yeah. So just under the title, you'll have um, a drop down oh, menu yes. right now. Oh. It's under the county as a whole, but you can go directly to the San Lorenzo Valley and it'll okay. load um, for the valley. And then for your particular um, uh, area there of of impact, um, I think we have a social associations um, indicator um, that might, you know, our arts data is a little bit limited, but I think it's important to think about kind of social environment um, indicators. Um, and you can look at some of these. So, um, the social associations data doesn't have a breakout by region, but it might just be important for you to, you know, look at mm -hmm. it and see um, if it lines up with what your population is experiencing. Um, this is uh, just a membership um, indicator in terms of how people are connected in their communities. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Eva is a great resource and is very available. So oh, not to overload you, Eva, but that's just a great example. <laughs> how helpful some targeted technical assistance can be. Yes. <laughs> Does anybody else want to share their, their search or questions while we're together? Thanks, Eva, for putting the links in the chat. Uh, Nicole, this is Cheryl, and Hi, Cheryl from the Diversity Center. Hi. And a um, cute, very cute dog picture. Just saying. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's the love of my life. Sorry, I'm moving from one place to another, so I it haven't been on video, but I've been here. Okay. Um, I my experiences. I also like data share a lot, and I have used the little bit that's on LGBTQ plus in a couple of our grants to be able to tie in national statistics to a local um, picture. Um, but as I addressed already in the chat, I um, it's uh, limited information. Uh, and um, I haven't found that the places where 
the promising practices. I haven't found them um, super useful. It's uh, the couple that I've actually tried to get more information on are pretty regular. And so that's been one area that I haven't been able to benefit. And just overall, I can only get a little bit of data, but it's better than nothing. So I'm not complaining. <laughs> yeah, so that's my experience. And I just I just went on right now. And a lot of my data, the data that we would use is still from 2021, which is not terrible, but it also is so volatile since uh, the pandemic. Yeah, and it sounds like, like I was explaining, more might be on the way. Um, yeah, exactly. That's so very exciting. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. But yeah, yeah. I think that's a good example of there are limitations and to work around or through. But Eva, did you want to add anything? Oh, well, I'll just say I'll reiterate, Cheryl, that I look forward to working with you and the staff person yeah, that's going to come on. Yeah. Um, I know that we've tried to be connected with the diversity in the center in the past and um, capacity has um, been one of the barriers. So I'm I'm really excited. And then as a group of the folks who are in here, um, like we can all do our part to fill this particular gap around soci SOGI data, um, so yeah. sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, the county is, uh, so we have uh, better access to county data tables um, because um, they're one of our partners. And so yeah. what data that they collect that we can externalize, um, we're, we're working on making that um, as streamlined as possible, which is great. Some of the data sets, it's just like, if you only have 10 people responding, it, you can't publish that data because it will identify yeah. people yeah. but you know some of the data sets we can respond to um for those who are interested and and want to be committed um to the equity piece around collecting data in your own work we actually have some um some um workshops uh that are recorded under our workshops um tab um that help program evaluators create a survey that is inclusive um, what does it look like? What categories? How do you place it? Where do you place it? Um, et cetera. So there's just like some basic guidelines um, so that at least in your own program, you're collecting identifiers that will expand your better understanding of, um, you know, different populations um, around um, this particular um, identifier. Yeah. Yeah. And in general, I actually was super impressed when I discovered it. I think it was Jen Hastings that actually very early on in my time at the Diversity Center and said, hey, you know, you can get some information from DataShare. When I went on, I have found it quite easy to use. I haven't been able to mine the information because it's not there, but that's, you know, that's that's only the result of um, a, a growth opportunity that everybody is participating in. But the actual website and the fact that the data is there i actually want to appreciate and say thank you so much it's really beautifully done thank you cheryl that's really good to hear we hope all yeah. of you've gotten some new ideas about how to use data share um, and how to improve it and it, i just want to emphasize again what eva said at the outset it is uh, constant work in progress, um, for better or for worse. So if you're not finding what you need today, um, do check back, um, let Eva know your ideas. Um, there are lots of great tutorials on data share for all of the things we've talked about. It really, really, really rewards time spent um, exploring it. So um, there's just a, a lot of different ways to use it and it, it just keeps getting better. So, um, Thanks everybody for being here to learn together. Um, we'll, we'll hang out for a bit to see if you have other questions for us, but I did wanna share some other upcoming um, training opportunities through CORE and also um, to have some ideas about um, getting your ideas about how to improve these trainings in the future because we do listen to your feedback and um, Really hope that you'll take the time to fill out a brief survey about today's session, as well as joining us for upcoming sessions. So we've got a series going about 
uh, proposals and grant writing. And so we've finished one last week and we'll have two coming up, one on April 11th about some of the communications and messaging around uh, making your case for your program. That's of course relevant to proposals, but other things as well, um, internal and external communications of various kinds. And then on May 2nd, we're gonna to return to the topic of evaluation that we touched on today with a session called the magic of metrics that will get into different kinds of evaluations and how to structure them and some resources associated with them. And we haven't gotten dates for this yet, but we will have a series of peer learning circles that will be much more sharing everybody's ideas about evaluation coming up um, probably in May. So stay tuned for those announcements and let us know your ideas um, as well for other training topics. We're very open to training and TA on whatever is most relevant to the community. So please let us know. And meanwhile, please use these QR codes and links that Giselle is putting in the chat to give us your feedback about today's session. Thanks again for being here. Thanks to Eva for co-presenting with us as always and to Stella and Gisela for making this material available in Spanish.